Star Walker Studios presents Game Master's Journey, your multi-dimensional RPG podcast. Hello, fellow gamer. Welcome to episode 149 of Game Master's Journey, your multi-dimensional RPG podcast. I'm Lex Starwalker. On this show, we discuss the craft and art of game mastering. Not only do I pass along any knowledge I've gained over 25 plus years of running RPGs, I also share wisdom from guest GMs and listener GMs like you. Listener GM Stephen Rhodes joins me on the show again today to discuss the craft and art of running RPGs as a game master. We talk about the similarities and differences between writing for video games and running RPG adventures. And we have some thoughts on using improvisation more as a GM. And Stephen points out yet another way that theater of the mind play is an invaluable tool in the improvisational GM's toolbox. We also talk about keeping a good balance in your games and making the most of those wonderful moments of, quote, downtime you have as a GM during a game session. We also discuss the difference between a DM PC and an NPC that travels with a party and how to know which side of that line you're on, and also how sometimes killing off a beloved NPC can be exactly what your story needs. Finally, we discuss how a GM wanting to improve her craft can learn a lot from books on writing, and we'll give you some recommendations. But before we get into all that GMing goodness, I want to send a shout out and a huge thank you to a couple new patrons of Starwalker Studio. So thank you very much to Clancy, Bennett, and Justin. Thank you very much for becoming patrons. Really appreciate it. It's the support of all the patrons that keeps this show going every week. And thank you very much. I also want to remind you that I am going to be publishing an adventure for D&D 5th edition very soon called The Trickster's Labyrinth. And the layout is now done. So we're doing a few finishing touches on the maps and on some interior illustrations and a final check and, and it's done. Every week we're a little closer. So I'm super excited and uh, it will be up for sale on my website at starwalkerstudios.com slash tricky once it's out. And you can go there now. The site is up now and you can see the cover image. Super cool. My wife Nikki did the cover art and it's gorgeous. So go check it out. All right. Well, I think that's enough about that today. I've talked a, a bit more about my adventure in previous episodes. So if you'd like to uh, hear more about it, go ahead and, and check out some of the previous episodes of Game Master's Journey. And I'm sure once it's actually out and available, I'll tell you more about it again. But today I want to get back to Stephen and our interview and our discussion on the art of game mastering. Stephen Rhodes is kind enough to join me on the show again today to talk about game mastering. And Stephen has written for a lot of video games, including the Lego games and The Witcher 3. He's currently working for Ubisoft games, and he's a writer on the 7 game and also on Open Legend RPG. And Stephen's been playing and running RPGs for a long time. And as a professional writer, he has some really interesting insights on GMing. And I learned a lot from talking to Steven and I really enjoyed it. And I hope that you will enjoy the second part of our interview. We've kind of mentioned it, but maybe you could tell us about the writing that you do professionally and, and how that does or doesn't relate to creating campaigns and adventures and all that good stuff? I think it's more the other way around from my point of view. I guess it's it's improved over time as I've done more writing, but like the first writing I ever really did, probably, apart from the odd bit in, in school, like creative writing, was was like RPG campaigns. That's sort of, that's where I sort of uh, spread my creative wings first, really, was writing adventures for RPGs. And then obviously as time has gone on, I've 
uh, sort of become a professional video game writer, it's kind of a lot of the lessons I've learned from storytelling in other media has sort of influenced my RPG writing. And I'm sure if I looked back now at campaigns I wrote 10 years ago, I'd probably cringe at the awfulness of them <laughs> because of the lack of like, you know, the lack of just some essential core like storytelling and like structure and, and themes and, you know, undertones. But yeah, it's like writing a video game is very similar to writing an RPG campaign in many respects. You know, you've got, you've got a main storyline, you've got a protagonist or multiple protagonists, you have like antagonistic forces and characters against them. And you have um, arcs that have highs and lows and, and tension and, and drama. And I think all of those elements go into making a really good RPG campaign. But I mean, it depends, it depends on the kind of campaign you like to write. I like to write story campaigns. I like my campaigns to have a storyline and to have recurring characters and have uh, tension and dramatic moments and epic encounters. Whereas some people, they like to run it where it's just dungeon crawling. It's like, right. you know, they just go in, smash smash down the doors and loot the treasure, um, which is fine. Like, that's the beauty of RPGs is you can play them in so many different ways. Whereas I've always liked to, I think even in video games, like, um, I like to structure with with the three core elements of, of what makes up an RPG, like combat and exploration and then interaction, like role playing, like with like talking with characters, mm -hmm. and I like to try and keep the balance between those three even. Yeah, um, and I think the same goes for like video games. You know, you wanna you wanna have you wanna have some gameplay. You wanna have some some like exploration. You wanna have some dialogue and interaction, but you wanna keep you wanna keep that balance. Or 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 you go you go to one extreme. You know, like you look at uh, like Telltale's games are very story driven, and there's not much gameplay to them, and they're very choice-based and narrative-focused, which is great and it works and it's, they're super fun to play. But there isn't that balance, whereas you look at like Call of Duty or, or Diablo. Diablo is a better example. Diablo is an RPG of pure dungeon-crawling, enemy-murdering. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there is a story and obviously there's a story to give it context, but the story is not the important bit. The important bit is killing all the things and picking up all the shiny things off the floor that fall out of the thing that you killed. Right, and you don't, you don't really have a choice either in that game, if I remember right, like, you know, your path through the story is kind of, it's pretty linear. Like, yeah, you, you're going to end up at the same point, no matter what you do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You, you, it's literally, you start at one point of a map and the, you get to the exit of the map that's usually on the opposite corner yeah. and you smash your way through killing everything <laughs> that moves until you get there and you rinse and repeat. And I love, I mean, I love Diablo. I love the story of Diablo. I, I, yeah. I really like the law in a game that, doesn't really put it front and center. I love the whole angel demon conflict and all that jazz. Yeah. But the game, it's not really about that in the game. In the game, it's about killing shit and getting loot and getting better loot and being able to kill harder things. And, you know, it's like a really good example in the video game space, I think, is Dark Souls. That series has such an interesting background and world building and lore to it, but it never puts it front and center. It always hides it in plain sight. So you don't get like told the story and what happened and who the characters are and why you're doing all of this. You just get told you're in this world and you've got to reignite the bonfire, rekindle the fire. And it's like, but the world is so steeped in lore and every location has a story and every character has a story and, and you can see all of this history that's happened. But the game never just outright tells you about it. It hides it in item descriptions and in really cryptic dialogue. And I love it. I love that because you've got that sense of of discovery and exploration. It's like you're it's like you're an archaeologist exploring the ruins of an ancient civilization and you're piecing together what happened from the clues that have been left behind. And the lore of Dark Souls feels like that. It feels like for me, one of the big parts of those games is working out the story because they're one of the few games that doesn't just give you the story on a plate. Whereas a lot of games, they give you the story on the plate and then you figure out how to overcome the other challenges. Mm -hmm. And I like that Dark Souls kind of keeps the lore still hidden from you and doesn't just give it you because that game gives you nothing for free, including the story. And that's what I love about it. It's like, you know, everything in that game, you have to pry from its dead cold fingers. Yeah. Well, I guess the big difference between um, video games and like tabletop RPGs is at least theoretically in a tabletop RPG, your, your options are, are endless. 
you know, in a, in a video game, there's only the options that the designers thought of and, and put into the game. You know, you can do A, B, C, or D, but, you know, as long as you have a, a game master who's willing to make things up on the fly, you could always come up with an option that the GM never thought of and be like, oh, yeah. we're all going to, I don't know, <laughs> do something completely you didn't think of. Well, it's like, I remember I listened to um, when you had Matt Koval on. Yeah. Um, he was also a video game writer. Like he was talking about how he did this whole map and had and like designed all these things. And, and then they were like, what's over there? And he was like, oh, it's just this thing. And they're like, well, we're going to go there now. And like he hasn't done anything for it. And that's so true. Yeah. And I think, I think being a GM and learning how to write a role play campaign is a really good exercise for people who want to write video games because it's basically the same kind of job except video games, you actually have restrictions that the player has to follow. Yeah. Whereas in an RPG, there is none. So it's much more dependent on your creative ability to describe what happens and, and help actually visualize that situation. Because, like, yeah, like if, you, if you're writing a game story, you know exactly where the player can go, you know exactly what they have access to, both in the game and information-wise, and you can use that to your advantage to craft a more interesting story but like that uses smoke and mirrors to hide all of its holes right whereas in an rpg like a like a tabletop rpg there is no way to do that because the players can go anywhere and the players can do anything yeah and it's up to you to make sure that whatever they choose to do is just as fulfilling as the stuff you hoped they would do yeah and that is like that's like the real challenge of that i think that shows the strength of a, of a truly talented gm is when they can where they can give content and they can run a game and you have no idea what stuff they prepared and what stuff they just did on the fly. So how do you how do you approach that? Like preparing uh, for a game when you don't know wh- where the players are going to go. Oh, I just fail at it miserably. <laughs> 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 I never said I was good at that. Um, they they do have a gift for picking. If you have a part of your map that is the least developed, that's where they're going to want to go. Yeah, well, the first thing is I don't, I don't use maps, so that's there the you first. Go. <laughs> like I um, I try and inhabit the the everything in the game in the theater of the mind, and I try and stick to that kind of of concept, which is, you know, you've got you've got the theater of the mind, or you've got the traditional maps, graphs, that sort of thing. You know, gridded maps where you actually have a tangible sense of space. Mm-hmm. Whereas I, tr- I run all of my campaigns and all of my adventures in the theater of the mind. So it's like the collective imagination. Um, and that, I think that does help because when you're, when you're describing things to them and they're like, they're imagining it and adding to it, it kind of focuses them. They can't really start thinking about a place that you haven't really talked about because they have right. no frame of reference to what else exists. So it's almost like a, a, a mental fog of war, if you will. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think that works quite well for the kind of campaigns I like to run because I like to do them quite linear and, and very narrative driven. Um, and I use that to keep things moving forward in the direction that I would like. But then I also I like to introduce side content that maybe isn't on the main path, but allows the players to explore the, the nearby area. And that is, that's probably where I do most of my like ad-libbing and sort of free roaming stuff where it's like I give them loose quests to do with a loose idea of structure. And then I let them sort of, I, I unleash the reins a little bit and let them loose. But then I'll always bring them back to that main path so we can continue. And I hope that like my players have been pretty good with it so far. I've, you know, when I was younger and I was still learning, or I was, you know, I'm still learning now, but when I was younger and I had less experience doing this, a lot of the times it did get derailed and it was hard to sort of bring people back to where I wanted them. And so now it's like I, I'm much better at, at being able to guide them back to the path and keep the path interesting enough where they want to push on and they want to find out more. Like I use like, again, like, like probably inspired by like Dark Souls and stuff, I like to leave breadcrumbs about what's really happening and what's really is going on and what the story is. And I leave them little breadcrumbs on that trail so they really want to follow that trail. Yeah. And I find that that's quite yeah. a good device to keep, keep players moving forward is giving them that little... A little nugget of information that, that that piques their interest, that makes them want to find more about what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Something I've been working on lately is like when I'm preparing for a game, is trying to spend more of my time on things that I know for sure, or I'm fairly sure the players are going to encounter, and spend less time on the things that aren't you know certain. So so like if the players start out and they're in a certain town. 
And I know, for instance, that one of the characters needs to buy more arrows. <laughs> then I know for sure that that character is going to go buy arrows. So, you know, if I need to give information to the party, well, maybe I, I work on the NPC that's going to be selling the arrows or, or is going to be in the shop at the same time. And just trying to focus more on things that I think are most likely to happen and less on all the stuff outside the town that is like, well, the, they may go there, they may not. Yeah. I don't know. And, and then learning to uh, stall <laughs> <laughs> when necessary. So, you know, if, if I'm thinking, oh, that, you know, they're going to spend half the session in this town interacting with these NPCs and right away they, they decide to leave town. You know, that's that's a great time to spring like maybe a quote random encounter that you've come up with and be like, well, this will eat up some time while I'm trying to figure out, well, what what happens next? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's, there's definitely something for for stalling like a hey, wild owl bear appears. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you've got to fight that. Yeah, that's the NPC thing is always an interesting thing. And I think I think maybe my recent experience with it is different because I'm basically running a campaign for a bunch of game developers. Okay. But like I, I populated a town with NPCs and they literally spent three hours in a tavern talking to every NPC in there. And it was so, I didn't think about it at the time. I kept thinking, oh my God, this is exhausting. I'm having to role play all of these different characters <laughs> I have no background for. Um, to the point where they even talked to horses. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> Like I had to role. Play, I had to ad lib role playing two horses that I had not anticipated having to have voices. Um, oh, wow. But afterwards, I was like, "Yeah, they went about that in such a video game way. They went around and clicked on every NPC to yeah. find out what the NPC knew or what they could give them." That's funny. and I was like, "Wow, that's such." I'd never had that before. Usually, players like that I've run for, they don't want to talk to everyone. They want to talk to like the pe the person that they feel like they have to, like the tavern, the innkeeper, or like the town like uh, the town mayor or something but they never want to talk to literally everyone in that tavern and they said to me like you know they're like oh you went to the tavern there's you know there's a hustle and bustle it's like late evening people come from work and they were like who's in the tavern and i like like i described a bunch of mcs like oh well, there's a table over there with a couple of halflings there's a table over there with a dwarf and there's a table over there with a you know like an elf who looks a bit like a cleric and then they're like and i just thought nothing of it and then they yeah. literally went and talked to every single one of them <laughs> And I learned a lesson. <laughs> I learned a valuable lesson that day. Yeah. Well, there there are um in the DMG there are some tables for randomly generating NPCs <laughs> that can come in handy sometimes. Oh yeah. But well, yeah, I mean, that's of, rough. Like, yeah, going back to um one of Matt Matt Koval did a YouTube video about tips for like running a campaign. Like yeah. um he's got a whole series of them and I love them all. Um and Matt. Um I love him, but um, one of them was like five tips or something. And one of them was have a sheet of random names. Yeah. I was like, oh my God. I was like, yeah, that's a really good idea. And my God, did that come in handy? Like <laughs> when we got to the first populated town and they wanted to know everyone, they wanted to know who everyone was. And I was frantically coming up with names. Yeah. So yeah, props, props to Matt for, for that tip because that was a lifesaver and it's, it's, that's definitely something that you should consider if you're running a campaign. I mean, some campaigns never go to towns. Right. You know, like that's another way of avoiding it. Just don't go to population centers. Just stay well away and, you know, go into the wilderness and find the abandoned castles and the dungeons and the forests. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, I like to keep that balance. So, you know, I like that some sessions, there's lots of fighting and lots of like action. And then some sessions, it's all talking and all RPing because I think it's, it's using a different a different muscle in your sort of RPG brain. I think it's good. Yeah. Yeah. Something I've learned uh, through years of running games is to uh, enjoy and take advantage of those times when the players really don't need you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like like when they're like like the perfect example, one of my my first adventures I ran in D D, they had to assault a a fort, basically. And I think they spent over like more than an entire session just planning, you know, how they were going to do this and coming up with a plan and then coming up with a different plan. And I spent so much of that time actually building the encounters and, 
<laughs> I was just yeah. behind the screen doing my own thing while the, the players just went on and on uh, planning endlessly. And, you know, I, I, I've seen lots of advice for DMs about, you know, how to get the players moving when they're just planning endlessly. And I'm like, I let them plan endlessly as long as I have something to do. And then once I've, I've got everything done, then I'll be like, okay, guys, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's one of those things. It's like, it's circumstantial. If they're like literally outside the keep, it's right, like, right. yeah, I mean, come on, guys. <laughs> you can't literally stand here all night talking about this. But if they're like in an inn planning a siege, like to happen later or whatever. Right. Like, I'm, I'm totally fine with them just taking forever and I'll just sit and watch. And I look like, it's great. I love it as a, as a GM. When my players just get so into it that they forget you exist. Yeah. And you just sit there and, and observe this this frantic discussion about what's the best and they start arguments like, no, that's a that's a stupid idea, or yeah. let's do this. And I, yeah, I love that stuff. You can even get great ideas of what like things you can do. Oh yeah. Because the players will just throw out, oh, what if uh what if the Baron is really a dragon in disguise? You're like, oh, that would be cool. What if yeah, the oh, Baron is a dragon maybe in disguise? Maybe he is now. <laughs> that's a really good idea. Yeah, that stuff. That's great. Like, so many, I get so many ideas for like my campaigns from the players and from what they decide to do. That even now, like, like we've talked about writing these these campaigns for like professional publication. Like even they are influenced by what my players have decided to do. Like they'll they'll go and talk to someone or or plan to do something. And I'm like, that's really cool. I'm gonna write that into the campaign because I think that's a nice little nugget of cool circumstance there. I think that would be that makes it better. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um so yeah, I love I love letting I love player agency. Like there's a lot to be said about player agency. And yeah, and I think I think letting players like let loose and, and do stuff like that is really, really healthy for a campaign and group. There was actually there was an article today actually on Bell of Lost Souls, which I don't know if you go on it. It's like a gaming news site thing. Um, they they do they've got a like a weekly RPG article thing going, which is, has been really useful. I found it really interesting. But they had one today, which was getting your players into your game, which was how to like encourage the players to sort of immerse themselves. And it's a really good article discussing various things you can do. There can be a wide variance in the amount of work you have to do like during a session. So like the the example you were just talking about where you're describing an inn and you just kind of offhand describe 10 different NPCs that you just made up on the spot. And now the players want to go talk to each and every one. Like that's a lot of work for you because you got to come up with all this and you're like working nonstop like that whole session. Yep. But then there's going to be times where the PCs are planning something and for two hours, you're kind of sitting back and maybe occasionally answering a question. But other than that, you don't really have to do anything. So I found to treasure those moments. Oh, yeah. And, you know, sometimes I'm productive. I'm planning things. And sometimes I'm just kicking back, just enjoying the fact that I don't have to do anything right now. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. As a GM, those moments are like little little nuggets of pleasure. Like just it's like, oh, like I don't have to talk for a while. This is great. And I can just watch and observe the players do their thing. I love I love that. Yeah. This is Matthew Colville and you're listening to Game Master's Journey. I want to give a quick shout out to the patrons of Starwalker Studios. The support of the patrons makes this show possible. If you enjoy Game Master's Journey and you'd like to give a little back, becoming a patron is a great way to do so. Patrons get some cool perks like game material I make for Primordia and access to a special monthly podcast I produce just for the patrons. I'd also like to give a huge shout out and thank you to my tier four patron, Mr. Steve Strickland. Let's hear it for Steve. Yeah. Yes. You the man. You the man. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you to all the patrons. You can find out more about becoming a patron by clicking on the Patreon button at the top of the show notes at starwalkerstudios.com. I think you said in, in one of our emails, you've been playing something like 15 years. So you've you've been around the block a few times. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm sure you've you've heard or even been part of discussions about the dreaded DMPC. 
right? Where, <laughs> where you as the dungeon master have your character that's in the party. Yeah. And there are obvious possible problems with that, especially when you go so far as it's an actual PC, like you have a character sheet, you know, because like, for instance, in fifth edition, there's a lot of differences between a PC and an NPC. Mm. So like, like, for instance, Curse of Strahd, there are a lot of NPCs that can join the party, but it's not like you have a character sheet in your tracking experience and leveling up this character like you would a PC. Like they're mechanically very different than a player character. Yeah. So I, I think in general, I agree that that having a your own PC can oftentimes it's not in itself a bad idea, but a lot of times it's going to take you to bad places. <laughs> So what do you, well, first of all, what do you think about that? Do you agree with that or, or not? So I've never had a DM PC. Oh, um, good for you. I have. Yeah. <laughs> In the early days, I've done that. <laughs> I think I can see the, I can see why some people would, would use them. I can see the usefulness, but I feel like, so there's a few things. So I think from a, like a immersion point of view, I think it breaks it a little bit because if you're the voice of every other character in the game, which as the DM you generally are, right. having a character that you are the specific voice for is difficult because then you've kind of like you'll have to like make sure that the players know when that character is talking and you're not doing any of the other twenty dozen characters that they could be interacting with at any point. Right. So for, I don't like it from that point of view because like essentially to have a dedicated PC that's for the DM to me is strange because you're literally everyone else in the world. Right. So you've got plenty of characters. Like, and I have, I have characters join the party all the time. But like you say, they're not player characters and it's always temporary. Yeah. And when I run them, I generally just have them hang back and like occasionally do something in combat, but not really get properly stuck in. Yeah. I like to, like they, they stick to the sidelines or they do nothing at all. Like I had one recently where a, a cleric joined the party, but when combats died, they were too afraid to get involved and they like hid at the back and like cowered in fear because they were like young and inexperienced and afraid. So, you know, it kept them out of the combat. Yeah. But they were there for they were there for the storyline stuff and they were there for the for the plot development. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, I think there's definitely a big difference between a DMPC and a DM NPC. And you can usually tell which it is just by the language that the DM will use. If they start saying something like my character in the party, you know, yeah. that's the the DM MP, or the DMPC. And I think a lot of times DMs rationalize it and they'll give you a very rational reason why that character is there. But a lot of times the real reason is I want to play too. Yeah. And I want to have my own character in, in the campaign. And I, I totally get that feeling because I, I do miss playing a lot. Like, you know, right now I'm not, playing at anything i'm just gming and i do kind of envy the people who just turn up every other week and roll some dice and play their character yeah and that's their that's literally their only input but it's i get a different sense of satisfaction from playing that i do dming and i don't think i'd ever like to try and mix them together yeah it doesn't work i when i was first starting out i i had the dm pc in fact i always had a dm pc oh wow okay i'm I mean, it was a long time ago. I, I'm sure part of it was that I wanted to play. Uh, but I think part of it was also that I thought I needed one in order to maybe give the players hints or have a way to interact with the players, things like that. But it, it, as far as the wanting to play too, I, it was never satisfying in that way. Because no. you're the DM. You're, you're never going to feel that satisfaction like, oh, I'm playing the game. It's like, if you want that, you just need to find a, a game you can play in. Yeah. You're not, yeah, it's, it's not going to work out. And there are just, you know, inherent problems of, you know, well, maybe you show favoritism to your character when treasure is handed out or your character, you know, when, when they're deciding how to assault the keep, your character has all the best ideas because, well, you're the DM and you know what's going to work and, and what isn't going to work or, yeah, I don't. I don't think they like for me. I don't know. I, like, I can understand it as a as a as a gaming aid for like like you said, like offering tips and stuff and like helping the players. I think for a new GM, it could work because 
they might not have the sort of necessary experience narratively to find smarter, more elegant ways to get the information to the players. So I can, I can see it from that side. But like you say, like if you've got, you can't have a player in the party when you're essentially the god of the world that they're in. Because <laughs> yeah. you know everything and you know what they're going to do and you know what they're going to fight and you know where they're going to end up. And it gives your character just way too much of, of an advantage. It'd be like going to do, um, it'd be like doing an escape room. You know those things where you go and it's like you've got to solve puzzles and you're like you're locked in. Yeah. Those experiences. It'd be like doing that with your friends when you've designed it. Right. Right. It's like you know, you know what's you know the puzzle, you know the you know the way to get out. Right. And you've got to either and you can't just sit there going, Oh, I don't know what's happening because the players know that you know. Yeah. yeah. So then it's just it, yeah, I just it just it, it sounds like it creates an awful, awful mess. Yeah, and the other problem with it is just the mechanical side of it. So back in like the first edition days, this might not have even been an issue because there wasn't much of a difference between an NPC and a PC. You know, they they were the NPCs yeah. were just as complicated as the PCs were. But like in fifth edition, if you look at any NPC like in the monster manual and compare that to any player character. Oh god, yeah. It's a massive difference. Yeah. It, it's like a, a, imagine trying to deal with a player character while you're also running a combat as a GM, you know, it's just, it's a, a nightmare. What do you do? Do you roll, do you roll attack damage against yourself and then roll to hit back? Like, yeah. how does that work? But you just, you, you have so many, like, like imagine if your character is a wizard, Oh God. And you've got all these spells and all these different things you could do. And it's like, just thinking about it, it makes my brain hurt. Yeah. So, so if you had an actual NPC, it'd be a lot easier because they're more streamlined. They don't have as many things they can do. Yeah. Where did you pick up that that particular, like, where did you, like, because obviously you must have found out about that at some point. Like, where did you learn to, like, where did you hear about doing that and decide to to try it? I think, well, when I started out, it, it I think it has to do with how I started out as a DM. I, I first found out about d and I really wanted to play, but I couldn't find people to play with. Because all the pe- I went to a very small high school and all the people who were playing d d already were playing, already had groups going and didn't want like a new person in their group. And so to basically play the game, I had to learn how to run it and recruit people who had never played before to be in my D&D group. So, so I think I had this very strong sense of I haven't been able to play the game very much and I want to play the game too. So I think for me, that was a lot of it was like, oh, I'm going to have my own character. I'm going to make my own character to be part of the party. And just I eventually just kind of out, outgrew that, I guess. Yeah. But since then, I've, I've heard a lot of discussions on podcasts and on blogs and everything about, you know, people. I mean, most people are against the idea and think it's it's a bad thing to do. Occasionally, you'll see someone like trying to defend it. But. Yeah, so so it's something people talk about. I was just curious what you thought about it, but it seems like you you somehow avoided that trap and and didn't ever go through your DMPC phase <laughs> like so many of us did. Yeah, that's weird to me now. I don't know. I don't know how how or why I avoided it. I think I don't know. I, I mean, if you've got like in your situation where you've got like finding new players is difficult, and maybe you're running for a small group, I could kind of. Like I can see why why there would be justifications for having a, a PC as a DM, but I don't know. Maybe I was just lucky, I guess. Like whenever like the people I role play, I ran role plays for, were people who'd done it before and who had experience doing it. So my group of friends when I was growing up, they all we all sort of did it together and, and we we learned together and they knew the game uh, and like some like there wasn't just me who DM. There was a few of us who DM, so we like took turns and stuff. And then at university, everyone I ran for, they also had played games before so and there was always a decent number of us so maybe it was just from that point of view that I never felt it was required because the players wouldn't need additional hints like there was enough of them where I didn't feel like I needed to help balance the party against the difficulty although there's plenty of better ways to do it anyway so yeah I guess I don't know maybe I was just lucky and I I guess I liked the I liked the concept of, of remaining like separate and being the sort of the rules of of the world and the campaign and being that impartial judge about all the events that were happening and having a character in the world that was invested in the group's success would feel contradictory. 
to yeah. what your role as a GM actually is. Yeah. So, well, yeah, I'd never really, i never really experienced it. So that's interesting. So something kind of going from that that I've discovered fairly recently that that's kind of interesting is I'm I'm definitely think the DMPC is a bad idea. <laughs> yes. And. <laughs> Even just from the, you know, you're better off with just an actual NPC because it's going to be less of a headache in combat and stuff. And also, like, you don't, I think a great way of, like, it, is my, is my character, because because a lot of times you'll see people say, well, I only have three players and no one wants to play a, quote, healer. So I'm going to have a cleric NPC that's part of the party so that they have that healing ability. Right. And, you know, that can be fine as long as you don't kind of cross that line. And, and I guess one way to know if you've crossed that line or not is ask yourself, what if the player characters fired my cleric NPC? Or what if they killed <laughs> my cleric NPC? Would I be more upset than I would if they did that to any other? Because I mean, as a DM, if you have a, a NPC you've really crafted and, you know, has an important role in the story and your char- your player characters just for no good reason kill them, you're going to be upset. You know, that's a lot of times. So that doesn't necessarily mean anything by itself, but would you be more upset <laughs> than you normally would? Because, well, this was my character that <laughs> you guys just <laughs> killed or fired. <laughs> yeah, well, the other, the other important thing to note in that situation is you're also the DM. So, you know, they can't kill your character if you don't want them to, really. True. Like that's the power you have as the DM, and which why it makes no sense to cross that line is because you control this world, and you know what you say is is law. So it's like they can't really like if you didn't want them to, they wouldn't kill your character because you could Deus Ex Machina that situation in like away. Yeah. And that's that's your role. So that's why it always it just sounds unnatural to me to to cross that right. that line right. and and be a player and a DM. Like I don't I don't see that ever working out properly but yeah i agree if people are doing it i guess you know well i think for the most part it's it's inexperienced gms that are doing it i don't often hear like experienced gms like singing the praises of the the dmpc it's more a a kind of a phase i think that we go through and then we learn yeah that doesn't really work real well i honestly think it's probably better to just run if you're new if you're new dms it's like just run like pre-done adventures play with pre-generated characters and just learn by experience and trial by fire and you will make mistakes even if you've got a dm pc or whatever but at least if you're doing it the way that experienced gms do it you're learning the right you're learning from the right mistakes yeah and you're learning as you go and i think because i think it's just best to just get stuck in and dm other people's content with characters that you guys haven't created and just play it and just make mistakes together and like learn from the mistakes together and get better as, as a, as players and DMs. And like, it's two different sides of the same game. It's, it's not symmetrical. It's an asymmetric situation, like playing as a player and playing as a DM are two completely different experiences. Yeah. And I don't think you, I don't think you'll ever get a situation where doing both at once is ever a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now that we've got that context laid down, Something I've been thinking about lately, and, and I ran into this when I was making this adventure I'm going to publish, is DMPC, normally not a good idea. However, as a DM, I've learned that having access to NPCs is really important. And if you're running an adventure, like say in a city, this might not even occur to you because if the player characters are in a city, there's always NPCs around. You know, so if for whatever reason, if they're in a tavern, if for whatever reason you want to interact with the players, you know, the bartender could come up, uh, one of the serving people could come up or another patron, you know, you, you have options to do that. But for instance, my adventure I just wrote, it's, you know, kind of a, a dungeon crawl site based adventure. And for the most part, the NPCs that the player characters encounter our adversaries you know they're they're not so much people that they could have a conversation with or if they did it wouldn't be a very amicable conversation and as i was running this with my group of players i realized i was like you know (laughs) i really need an npc in here i really need someone somewhere in this dungeon 
who is at least potentially friendly so that I can have a conversation with the player characters. So I ended up writing in an NPC for that reason. Um, so I was just curious if you've kind of had that, that same feeling or if you've ever run into that where you're in a situation where you realize it was, it was really a drag not having some way to interact with the player characters with the character like in the world. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Like over the years of, of running RPGs, I've definitely come into that situation where I was like, oh, I wish I wish I had a character here that they could talk to, you know, for various different reasons. Like, oh, I just think it'd be cool to have that option or wow, this combat's going to be way too hard and they're all going to get murdered. And I wish I had a way <laughs> to get out of this without killing them. You know, that didn't feel phony because you don't ever want to pull back that veil. Like you always want to make the players feel that you're in control of the situation and everything that's happening is happening through design. And, you know, so you don't want to, you don't want to have to end the combat by like Deus Ex machina something and it just feeling really cheap. Right. Because that's going to take away the feeling of immersion. But yeah, I mean, I guess in my younger days, probably that problem was a lot, but I think I'm a bit more savvy to it now. And I have a lot of NPCs in my games, a lot of recurring NPCs that the players can always find and talk to and will sometimes ally with the party. Even when like, okay, so a good example that I can use as a context for this is in my campaign recently, I had in that tavern that I was talking about with all the NPCs that they then talked to, there was an elf cleric who was in the area because there was this rumors of like these cursed trees or whatever. And like the forest was sick and stuff. And all it was, was I wanted a side quest where they could go into a forest and fight like a corrupted druid. And I just wanted this. It was sowing the seeds for my campaign's main storyline. So I just wanted it. I was like, that's a cool side quest. It'll take them a couple of hours or whatever. But I, the NPC went with them um, just in case. I didn't expect it to happen because I'd planned for it to be a fight. The NPC went along just in case they found a way or convinced me enough that they could talk their way out of it. And then she could interject and help with that. Mm -hmm. Or if one of the characters was grievously injured to the point where they almost died, she was a cleric so she could heal them and like at least stabilize them until they got back to town. So she served multiple functions, but I, I did that and I kept her there because she gave me flexibility as a GM. Yeah. And she didn't really take part in the combat. She like hid at the back and stuff because she was a she didn't like fighting or whatever. Um, so she didn't really change the the difficulty of the combat. So the fight was still pretty intense and it was cool and they like really enjoyed it. But she was there just in case they did things that I didn't anticipate. And I think using NPCs in that way is good, especially when like when you were talking about being in a city. And like, you know, going into these sort of Tarantino-esque tense standoffs. Yeah. Like having a having a character that you can use to sort of break the deadlock can be really, really useful. Yeah. But I think it's also a good time to introduce a new character. So in that situation you were describing, a new character jumps in and changes the situa situation. And that's the character's introduction to the players. And they're like, oh, I'm glad I caught you in time. I've been looking for you guys, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And then you then you've got then you fix the issue you had. And you've introduced a new character and now they've got an ally in the town, which they might not have had before. And so there are ways to get around it, but I think all of those ways come from fucking up and doing it wrong. Yeah. In your actual campaigns. I don't think you, I think there's a lot of like, there's lots of books and lots of like online stuff about DMing and how to do it and ways to structure campaigns. But I think there's lots of little pitfalls that people don't ever see coming and that you can't really anticipate. And that's where the experience comes in of like learning how to GM and learning how to improvise correctly yeah. when the situation calls for I think NPCs are a really useful tool. Like I've always got a couple of NPCs in my back pocket just in case something yeah. needs to happen. I think it's good practice to get into that mindset. Yeah, something I've, I've learned from this is to be watchful for any situation I create where there's not any believable way that I could bring some kind of NPC in because... Yeah. And, and like you said, there's a lot of reasons like maybe, for instance, in this particular adventure, there's this cool kind of background stuff that unless the, the player characters went certain places or, or made certain investigations, like there's really, they, they could go through the whole thing and not realize any of it. Yep. And, and I realized, well, it'd be nice to have a, an NPC that could maybe give them a hint if they need it, you know, not sit here and tell them everything like the end of a Scooby-Doo episode, but <laughs> but just give them a couple hints to, to let them know, hey, there's more going on here than, than what you're seeing and maybe you should dig a little deeper. 
And, you know, just by the, the nature of what I'd done with the adventure, it was really hard for me just on the fly during a session to do that in a way that, that didn't seem like deus ex machina, like, oh, where'd this person come from? And, and it just made me realize is like, you know, be careful of these times when like the player characters are out in the middle of, middle of nowhere and there's no one else around and there's n- nothing that could talk to them. Yeah. I mean, you might just get bored if they have a whole session of they're just planning. It's like, wow, I really have nothing to do as a DM this whole session. It'd be nice at least if someone could, a traveler on the road could come by so I can at least role play a little bit, you know, even though this guy doesn't know anything useful, but it's just something for me to do. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I love that. I love that dynamic of, of RPGs and how that works, that you can just add stuff like that and change stuff on the fly. Yeah. But it, I think I think again it always goes back to player agency like you never want to take the player agency away from them. Like it, it's like the whole situation of like having the players arrested and having them in a situation that they cannot get out of. I think it, I think it goes again to what you're talking about here with the NPCs. It's like you never really want to orchestrate a situation where the players are very limited in what they can do and what they can have access to. And it's very difficult as a GM to see those scenarios coming and trying to plan against them. Yeah. So yeah, it's always good to have options there and uh, to introduce elements that you know can help down the road if it's needed. Yeah. For new GMs, I think a lot of the problems come from they don't want to run NPCs because that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like playing characters in, in a role play game is, is scary and being in charge of all these different NPCs can be daunting because you're afraid that they might say you might say something wrong that, that isn't right or they might do something that like forces the players to go in a direction that you never wanted them to. So I think I think that's where probably the DMPC comes in. It's like that they're scared of running a lot of NPCs, so they feel if they just have one character that they can dedicate themselves to, it makes it a simpler task. Yeah. But then I think, yeah, but like all the problems we've discussed, you know. Yeah. Well, one thing with, with PCs is there are sometimes exceptions, but generally speaking, player characters tend to put up with a lot more crap from each other than is a lot of times realistic because it's like, well, we're all playing. We all have our characters. You know, we're not going to kick Joe's character out of the party because then what is Joe going to do every week when he comes to game with us? Yeah. So I I think one way to kind of keep that distinction with your NPCs is to think about if you have an NPC that's part of the party, it's like, what would make this NPC walk? Because this NPC isn't going to just put up with anything and stay with these guys no matter what. You know, they, they have limits and it'll be different for different characters. So maybe a certain character, if a PC just treats them with disrespect, they're like, I'm out of here. Yeah. You know, another character, it might take more, but every NPC should have like kind of their, you know, what's their limit of what they're going to take from these characters before they've had enough. <laughs> yeah. And, and players love finding those limits. Yes. <laughs> they love finding them. It's like, oh, I wonder how far we can push this this character. You know, they, it's... They love doing that because like you say, they're NPCs, so they treat them differently than they do each other. Right. And they give each other so much crap. But <laughs> if, if an NPC gives them crap, it's like, right, that's it. The swords are coming out and <laughs> the character's dying. It's like it is, it's yeah. like double standards. The poor NPCs, they get they get treated badly. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's that's why it's good to have lots of them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, don't get too attached to any any single one because who knows what's gonna happen. Yeah. Plus it's good to it's good to have characters killed off as well. And it's good to do that from a GM side. I think it's good to show the players that this is a dangerous world and characters will die. So that NPC who's been with you for three three sessions that is really useful and you really like, guess what? They're going to die next session. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it gives them, you know, rather than having to kill players off to prove a point, you can kill NPCs off to prove the same point. And I think sometimes it's just as effective. Yeah, I've yeah. definitely done that. Kill a... Kill a- an oh, yeah. NPC friend off in a very gruesome way, just to make a point. <laughs> just to up that pucker factor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't remember who said this. Oh, I, I wish I remembered, but it's like, they said like, I think it was the Game of Thrones writers for the TV show. They were okay. like, we knew when we had to kill a character off because it was when we started to like them. <laughs> like once we liked a character too much, that's when we decided that, yeah, we had to kill them off because they knew that that would give maximum impact to the audience and i think you can apply the same logic to to rpgs if the characters love that character the npc that you created for them and they love having them around you should kill them yeah you should kill them because the players will feel that and i think like any kind of creative media be it rpgs films tv games whatever 
the whole point of all of it is to have experiences and feel emotion. So I think if you can if you can sculpt a situation where you know that there's going to be an emotional impact, you should go for it and you should make them have that emotional impact. And I guarantee that that's what they'll talk about. Yeah. Like the next day at work when you're all gathered around, they're like, oh man, I can't believe that character died. I was so sad. <laughs> I think it was uh, Stephen King. It might have been on his his book uh, on writing. He was talking about how to really pull people into a story. And he was like, step one, make the reader love the character. Step two, really screw with that character. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. He's a master at that. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's 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 great at tormenting his, his characters. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's one of the joys of being a writer, right? Is that I get to create these characters and I get to build them and, and craft their personality. And then I get to put them in horrific situations that, that no one should really have to deal with. Yeah. You know, it's that's part of the fun of, of doing this sort of thing. Um, I love that book. Yeah. That on writing is, uh, is incredible. Yeah, it's good stuff. And you can learn a lot as, as a GM from, from writing books like that one. Oh God, yeah. I mean, I think it's the Dungeon Master's Guide of 5th Edition for D&D. In the back, there is a, a massive list of things that, like works that they consider useful or inspirational for DMs. And uh, like, yeah. I've read a lot of the things on that list and they are all spot on. Like Story by Robert McKee is on there. Yeah. On Writing by Stephen King's on there. It's yeah. like, you know, if, if you're a GM and you want to be a good GM and you want to improve in your craft, the next best thing that you can do other than playing as a GM is to read the, some of that material. Yeah. You know, because the storytelling techniques used across anything apply to writing a story as a GM. Yeah. And there's actually an audio version of On Writing that's read by Stephen King himself, which is how I quote read it. Oh, wow. Um, that's cool. Yeah. It's really good. Because a lot of that book is kind of his anecdotes. So it's kind of fun to hear him tell it in his own voice yeah. instead of having to read it. Yeah, it's, it's nice to read, because I've read so many of his books, it's nice to read a book that's in his voice entirely and it's not yeah. in like, like actual like narration. It's like proper just him talking. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a great book. I, I think everyone should read it. It's, it's super fun. All right, man. Well, well thanks for coming on and uh, you're welcome back anytime. Yeah, man, we should, we should, uh, we should do it again, definitely. I've enjoyed this. I want to thank Stephen again for taking his valuable time and joining me on the show today. Thank you so much, Stephen. I had a great time and I hope you'll be coming back soon. I hope, listener, that you enjoyed this interview as, as much as I enjoyed doing it. And if you missed the first part of the interview, you can catch that in the previous episode, episode 148 over at starwalkerstudios.com. And there are a lot of great ways that you can get a hold of Steven and see what he's up to. You can check out the show notes for episode 149 over at starwalkerstudios.com. And I've got links to some of his projects that he's writing on over there. You can follow him on Twitter at Rhodes underscore rights. That's at R-H-O-D-E-S underscore W-R-I-T-E-S. Or again, I will have that information in the show notes at starwalkerstudios.com as well. But I encourage you to follow Stephen on Twitter and, and keep up with what he's doing and, and into lately. I also want to send a thank you and a huge shout out to Christian Paez from Colombia, a listener in Colombia. How cool is that? For your five-star review on iTunes, Christian says, this is a must listen for all GMs. I started DMing D&D a couple months ago, and this show really helps me with all of the struggle of the first days. I'm from Columbia, and there's not a lot of D&D resources around here, but this show taught me a lot about the art of DMing, and I totally recommend it. So Christian, thank you so much for your review. I really appreciate it, and I'm really ecstatic that someone is listening to this show in Columbia. That is so cool. You know, my wife, Nikki, uh, was born in Columbia, and we are really hoping to visit Columbia someday. I, I know Nikki really wants to see the land of her ancestors. So that's really cool that we have at least one Colombian listener. I really love hearing from listeners from other parts of the world. That's it, one of the really cool things about podcasting is, you know, unlike radio, my, my listenership is not 
limited by any kind of uh, radius <laughs> from where I am in the world. And people can listen to this show anywhere and and do listen to it almost anywhere. And that's super cool. So if you're listening to Game Master's Journey and you're somewhere other than the United States, I'd love to hear from you just to hear you know, where where people are that are, are listening to the show and, and playing RPGs. It's really cool how this this hobby can can bring people together all across the world. Super, super cool. So thank you again for your five-star review on iTunes. And to all the listeners, leaving a review on iTunes is a great way that you can support the show and help new listeners find the show. So that's going to wrap it up for episode 149. If you would like to get a hold of me, if you'd like to give me some feedback on the show or ask a question or submit a future topic or just say hi, the greatest way to do so is just head to my website, starwalkerseos.com. You can find all of my contact information there. You can find my email address, my Twitter, Google+, Facebook, Pinterest, YouTube, all that good stuff. I also have a voicemail number for Game Master's Journey that you can call if you'd like to leave me an audio message, or you can email me an MP3 or a wave or, or some other sound file if you prefer. And that's a great way to get a hold of me and give feedback or ask a question. And if your question or feedback is entertaining or enlightening or both, you might even hear it on the show. So again, if you'd like to get a hold of the show, head to starwalkerstudios.com and there are lots of really easy ways that you can get in touch with me. And I'd love to hear from you. Also at starwalkerstudios.com, you can find a link to our community on Google's Pl- on Google Plus, Game Master's Journey community, where you can share ideas and thoughts with other listener GMs and with myself. And we have new people joining the community every week. It's really taking off. And all kinds of GMs there running, running all kinds of games, not just D&D. And people will, will post questions or ask for ideas about their campaigns or whatever they're doing. And some GMs have shared maps or uh, information from their homebrew worlds, which is super cool. So it's just a great place to interact with other people in the hobby And unlike so many other places out there on the internet where you can talk about RPGs, everybody on the Game Master's Journey community is respectful and well-behaved. And I've gotten so spoiled (laughs) from our community that I really don't spend a lot of time on other RPG communities, whether that's on Google Plus or Facebook or, or Reddit or various forums or whatever, just because... So many of these other places are just cesspools of indecency and rudeness and childishness, and we don't have any of that (laughs) in our community. So it's like, why deal with all the crap when I can just talk to the people in the Game Master's Journey community and have nice, uh, intelligent and insightful and adult conversations about RPGs, about this hobby that we all love. So I really encourage you to join the community. I, I know not everybody is is savvy on the Google Plus, but honestly, it's just like going to any other web page on the internet. It's no different. Um, you just have to request to join the community because I do moderate it uh, to avoid the spam bots and whatnot. So I usually pretty timely in approving those requests. And then you can share ideas and thoughts with all of us. And we'd love to have you join us. Also on the website, starwalkerstudios.com, on our support page, you can find out about all of the great ways that you can help support the show. I mentioned leaving reviews on iTunes. Another great way to support the show is to become a patron and really appreciate all the patrons and patrons get some, some cool bonus content from Star Walker Studios. You can also leave a one-time donation and you can also use my Amazon referral link that you can just click on that to go to Amazon and buy whatever you want to buy. And another way that you can support the show that I don't talk about so much anymore is you can get a a free trial for Audible books through Game Master's Journey. You can get a free month and we get a little kickback. And if I can find an Audible version of Stephen King's book on writing, which I don't know if they'll have it or not, but if they do, I will put a link to that in the show notes at starwalkerstudios.com. If not, I'll, I'll find an Amazon link and, and put that in the show notes or maybe both. 
And so you can check out that that book. And I highly recommend the audio form that Stephen King reads himself, if you can find that. And like I said, I'm going to try and find it on Audible. And if so, I will have that in the show notes. But highly recommend that book. It's an excellent book about writing. It's just an excellent book of stories of, of a man's life. And there is a lot that you can take from that and directly apply to being a game master, which is what we're all about here at Game Master's Journey. So I hope that you have a chance to play your favorite RPG this week, whatever that may be. I'll be back soon with another episode of Game Master's Journey. Until then, game on. This has been a Starwalker Studios production. Your source for quality gaming and hobby podcasts. This episode's music, courtesy of Cloudwalker, Transboy, Renfield, Stanko, and Ish. See the show notes for more details at starwalkerstudios.com slash Game Master's Journey.